Who or what is in a position of authority over you? Parents? Boss? Governing authorities? Laws of the land? The Constitution of the United States? Pastors? Elders? Who is the final authority to which all other authorities must bow? And the answer, assuredly, is God. Every authority in your life is under the authority, the ultimate authority, of the Creator, the sustainer of everyone and everything. Yet the question that we have to ask is, how do we know what God does or says with His authority? How do I know that I am actually submitting to God's authority? If he has it all, I need to know what he authoritatively speaks. And that's why we're turning to the book of 2 Peter chapter 1, starting with verse 16. So grab a Bible. If you didn't bring one, there should be one on the road near you. 2 Peter chapter 1, we're going to look at verses 16 through 21. And as you're finding your place there, let me just give you the theme. This is, this is what these verses are about. The scriptures are more stable, more steadfast, and more confirmed than anything else in all creation. The written word of God is more stable, more steadfast, more confirmed than anything else in all creation. Because they are the very words of God. Therefore, you must pay attention to it. That's the whole point of these verses. I have three things that I want to point you to as we walk through this passage. And the first is what the scriptures are not. As we consider the authority of the written word of God... Well, Peter first goes to, in this section, what the Scriptures are not. And we're going to jump around a bit so we can hit all four things that he says the Scriptures are not. And then we'll look at what the Apostle Peter says the Scriptures are. And then finally, we'll just ask, so what? There are many who believe the Scriptures are authoritative, and it makes little difference in their life. What the scriptures are not, what the scriptures are, and so what. So start with me and let's look at what the scriptures are not. The first in verse 16. Look at it with me. The scriptures are not cleverly devised by men. That's the first thing that the Apostle Peter says. The scriptures are not cleverly devised by men. Read verse 16. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We did not follow cleverly devised myths. In the Greek, this just means we did not play the sophist. How many of you are glad that we have Bible translators and go, well, I have no idea what that would mean. To play the sophist means a clever and plausible but false argument or a form of reasoning. It meant to try to argue in such a way that you were so good at arguing or phrasing what you were teaching that it could be a lie and people would still believe you because your argumentation was so good. Because it seemed like you were so wise because you were so clever at devising the way that you would teach. And the first thing the Apostle Peter says is that we did not follow sophists. We didn't play the sophist when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now, if you look at verse 16, is he talking about the scriptures there? Not necessarily. But everything that he's saying in verses 16 through 21 serves to support what he's really getting across to us. That's why I'm going to say everything he's saying, he's pointing us to the written word of God. Peter has a bit of a circular argument. He says something, and then he says something else, and then he comes back. He's not just a straight line. 
people who know how to read first century Greek better than I will tell you that Peter was probably not very well educated. It's hard for people to translate what he wrote in the Greek into English sometimes because he just keeps repeating himself and he doesn't use big words like Luke or like the Apostle Paul. His argument is a bit circular, but he's getting at the fact that the scriptures are not cleverly devised by men. That is to say, they're not maliciously manufactured for the gain of the person that wrote them or teaches them. That's his point. We did not follow after cleverly devised, and then he calls them myths. What this means for us, first of all, the scriptures are not cleverly devised by men, means that the apostles did not sit around and think, what can we write or what can we teach that will further our standing in society or keep us in good health or make our lives last longer than they would have or glorify us before men. That's what Peter's saying. We didn't cleverly devise the scriptures, what we wrote, in order to lift ourselves up. It should be apparent to you that the apostles and the prophets did not write down the scriptures in order to lift themselves up. And this is why it should be apparent. Every apostle other than the apostle John was murdered for what they wrote and what they said. John was boiled alive in oil. They weren't trying to gain a reputation or try to get themselves wealthy or keep themselves healthy or be seen as great in the world. They're not cleverly devised by men. That's the first thing that you and I need to realize. That's important enough for the Apostle Peter to say, this is not a product of men being clever, of playing the sophist, in order to lift ourselves up in the world. Do you read the scriptures or teach the scriptures, cleverly thinking how this can further your own state in the world? Do you go to the Bible and as you read it on your own, your motives are, how can this lift me up in the world? Do you teach the scriptures? in such a way that it would be cleverly devised. You're really playing the sophist. You don't necessarily believe what you're saying is true, but you think if you do it in this way, men will love you. Men will lift you up. If that's you, repent. Turn from that. The scriptures are not cleverly devised by men, and so we must not be looking to them in order to lift ourselves up as far as our state or our health or our wealth in the world. As the apostles were all murdered, except John, so the world will hate us. The second thing I draw your attention to, it's in the same verse, in verse 16, is that the scriptures are not myths. That's what Peter says. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The scriptures are not stories for learning lessons. They're not fables for inspiration. The scriptures are not myths for motivation. They are the very words of God, and it is for transformation. Do you read the scripture to learn lessons? Do you read the scripture or teach the scripture as if they're fables, but they're very inspiring? Do you read the scriptures or teach the scriptures as if they are myths, but they're very motivating for my life? I suspect that many pulpits are filled with preachers who maybe don't believe these are myths, but they teach it as though they are? Do you read it as though this is just a story to help me on my journey? Or do you realize what the Apostle Peter is saying? These are not made up. The third thing that Peter says the scriptures are not is in verse 20. Jump down and look at verse 20. The scriptures are not man's interpretation of God. 
The scriptures are not man's interpretation of God. He says, knowing this, first of all, verse 20, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. What does that mean? It means nothing that's written down in the scriptures are merely God influencing the writer so that the writer would then interpret what God is saying and then write it down for us. It's his interpretation of the truth. That's why Peter says that. Get that out of your mind. That's not what the scriptures are. God doesn't drop something in and then the apostle or the prophet who penned it is thinking, how do I interpret what God just told me and I'll try to interpret it. That's not what the scriptures are. They're not man's interpretation of God. The fourth thing that he tells us is in verse 21. Look at that. The scriptures are not produced by the will of man. He says, for no prophecy was ever, what's that word again? Ever. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. Meaning it wasn't a man who thought, I need to do this. I need to write this. It doesn't originate in the will of man. Though men used their wills as God spoke to them and through them and they penned the scripture, it wasn't an act simply of their will. It didn't come from their own interpretation. The scriptures were not produced by the will of man. So what are they not? This is important that he starts with this. Let's, let's clear away all the garbage. The scriptures are not cleverly devised by men. They're not myths. They actually happened. The scriptures are not man's interpretation of God. And the scriptures are not produced by the will of of man. And so this leaves us asking then, well, what are they then? That's what they're not, what the scriptures are. Look at verse 16 again. At the end of it, he gives us the first hint. Though he's not yet, in verse 16, hammering down the written word of God, but his whole thought is built on what he's going to say later in verses 20 and 21. He says in verse 16, the scriptures are eyewitness testimony, meaning their first-hand accounts. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we, meaning the apostles, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. There's the first mark of what scripture is. Not all scripture is historical and it's like the gospel accounts, eyewitness testimony. But what Peter is wanting us to realize is that when he talked about the coming and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, it was firsthand knowledge. I saw his majesty. And he has a point in revealing that to us and even saying that because he's about to write about the transfiguration of Jesus. That Peter, James, and John went up on the mountain with the Lord and they saw him transfigured before them. They saw his majesty. That's how he puts it at the end of verse 16. And then he's going to say, and the Bible's better than that mountaintop. But everything he's saying is supporting and building to where he's going in verses 20 and 21. The scriptures are eyewitness testimony. That means they're they're firsthand knowledge given to them by God. Second, in one of our longer points, somewhere we have to camp, is that the scriptures proceed from the majestic glory. That's not a clever way that I can put it. That's just literally the way Peter puts it. Read it. Look at verses 17 and 18. The scriptures proceed from the majestic glory. He's going to make this explicit later in verses 21 and 20. But for right now, he calls God, the Father, in particular, majestic glory. Verse 17. He's just said, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty... For when he, that's the Lord Jesus, received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, 
Now stop right there. It is not necessary for you to know every Greek word as you're studying the New Testament. It's not necessary. It's not necessary for you to know every Hebrew word as you're studying the Old Testament. But it can be a great benefit to us at times, and that's why you need to have pastors and teachers who do the hard work and read every Greek word and then go, well, that one they definitely need to know. This word that's translated born, the voice was born with an E on the end, not birthed, born meaning carried to him by the majestic glory. That's the Greek word pharaoh. He's going to use it again in the next verse, and he's going to use it again in verse 21. I just say that so that you, you remember. This word born is the same word that's translated carried later in the passage. That's important. It's not interesting alone. That's important for us to understand what Peter is saying. So this voice was carried to him, was born to him by the majestic glory, and then continue. This, this is what God the Father said from heaven. This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. When that happened, Peter saying, verse 18, we ourselves heard this very vo voice born, again, from heaven. For we were with him on the holy mountain. What he's doing is laying a foundation for who the Lord Jesus Christ is and who God the Father is. He's drawing them to the Mount of Transfiguration, which you can read about in Mark chapter 9, one spot. And he's saying, the majestic glory audibly spoke from heaven. And we heard it with our own ears. I was eyewitness of Jesus' majesty, and we heard the majestic glory as he spoke from heaven. So suffice it to say, what Peter is doing is laying this foundation that he's going to make explicit later in the passage, that all of the scriptures, the written word of God, the Bible, the prophetic word, proceeds from the majestic glory. This is the author of the scriptures. Why is that important to know? Well, it's important to know who you're hearing from. And to not just have a vague idea of God, there's God with a white robe and a beard sitting in the clouds. That's not what you should know. That's not what you should think when you're thinking about God speaking to you in the Scripture. So the Apostle Peter says, what's another name to call God the Father? The majestic glory. And he lumps the Lord Jesus in there too. You notice he uses the same word at the end of verse 16. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. In what ways is God majestic? Well, he came to Moses as a flame of fire. He came to the people of Israel covered in thick darkness and shaking the mountain. He came to Isaiah as one whose entire robe filled the temple. He came to Job as a whirlwind. He came to the prophet Ezekiel as armored fire. Ezekiel doesn't know how to explain what he's singing, seeing when the Lord manifests himself to him. And if you go and read the prophet Ezekiel, he's just, it's like fire that's wearing armor. I, that's what I've got. This is the majestic glory. He came to Joshua as a warrior with a drawn sword prepared for battle. He came to the apostle John as one from whose mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face, what was his face like, John? His face was like the sun shining in full force. This is the majestic glory. This is the God who speaks in his written word to you and me. This is the Lord, the creator, the sustainer of everyone and everything. He is glorious. He's superb, splendid, magnificent, 
What single word could we use to sum up all of that? Majestic. This is who the scriptures proceed from. And John is, or Peter rather, is drawing us to what Peter, James, and John saw on the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus was transfigured before them. That word is metamorphosized. Like we think of a butterfly, totally transformed into something else. And Peter, James, and John say, right before our eyes, he was transfigured. What did he look like? His clothes became dazzling white, brighter than anyone could bleach them. And we read that they were terrified. A cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. The majestic glory spoke. And now put yourself in that situation. Hearing the majestic glory, God himself audibly speak. Can you even fathom what that must have sounded like? The thundering forth of his voice? Or was it soft? I don't know what it was like, but Peter does. Peter heard it. And when he's drawing us to realize who the scriptures come from, he draws us to the majesty of God. So the scriptures proceed from the majestic glory. And the scriptures are the very words of God himself, carried from heaven. That's what Peter says. That's what's true. Do you know that's true already? Have you seen this passage before and you go, yeah, 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 yeah. I know the scriptures are authoritative. I know it's God's word. Look at how the apostle Peter explains it to us. Look at verse 21. The second half of verse 21, rather. The scriptures are the very words of God himself carried from heaven. He says in the second half of verse 21, But men spoke from God as they were carried, Pharaoh, by the Holy Spirit. Why does he use the same exact word when he's talking about the majestic glory, God the Father speaking audibly from heaven, and he and James and John hearing the audible voice of God, he says, this voice was carried, born from heaven. We heard it. And then he gets to verse 21 and says, nothing originated in man. It wasn't by man's interpretation, but men spoke from God as they were, he uses the same word, carried by the Holy Spirit. I think what Peter is clearly saying to us is that the same way the audible voice of God was carried to them on the mountain is the same way the very voice of God is contained in the scriptures. Because as men spoke and as men wrote, in the same way it was carried from heaven there, it's carried from heaven to the pages of scripture through his prophets and apostles. You see what that means? Do you see why he would go on to say things like, we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed? Men spoke from God. Thomas Watson says, the image of Diana was had in veneration by the Ephesians because they supposed that that image fell from Jupiter. The Holy Scripture is to be highly reverenced and esteemed because we are sure it came from heaven. The two testaments are the two lips by which God has spoken to us. This is what your Bible is. Proceeding from the the majesty, the majestic glory, and the very words of God himself. The writings of the prophets and apostles are the chariot by which God carries his word to us on the earth. The written word of God is supremely authoritative. Nothing should have a higher place in your life. Nothing should have a higher place in your home. Nothing should have a higher place in the church that you're a part of. Because the scriptures are the very words of God himself. It is the final rule for faith and practice. 
So what? This is how many professed Christians live their life. Check the box. The scriptures are authoritative. Yes, I believe. Do you believe the scriptures are the word of God? Yes, I believe the scriptures are the word of God. So what? Does that change anything? What does Peter say? Peter answers the so what in the passage. That's why I have confidence in asking so what, because God tells us so what through the apostle. Look at the very beginning of verse 19. So what? The scriptures are more sure than hearing the audible voice of God. Just chew on that. That's exactly what Peter's saying. We were on the mountain. We heard the voice carried from heaven of the majestic glory. But we have the Bible, and that's better. That's what he's saying. We have the written word of God. We have the prophetic word more stable, more steadfast, more trusty, more fully confirmed. Your translation may say, more sure. Do you see his argument? You have to see it yourself. Don't take my word for it. Look at how he moves through. We heard it. We have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. What if the Lord Jesus spoke to you in some way and made it absolutely clear I'd love to come to your house tomorrow morning for a Bible study. Sit down, face to face. I'll speak to you. How many of you are sleeping in? Jesus is going to be there. I'm going to be there. And Peter is saying, the Bible's better than that. The Bible's better than mountaintop experiences like Peter, James, and John had on the Mount of Transfiguration. The prophetic word is more fully confirmed. You have a mountaintop experience, and that's great, but that won't sustain you. You go back to that, and you just try to remember what you heard. Peter heard a few words, and he calls it majestic. He calls it the holy mountain, because what happened there consecrated that place, because The Lord Jesus was transfigured and the Lord God spoke. But still, he says, we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. God has given us something more fully confirmed than eyewitness testimony alone. He has given us something more stable than man's interpretation of God. We have something in the Bible more steadfast than the rock of Gibraltar. Something more secure than Fort Knox. It's the prophetic word. More to be desired is the scriptures and what God has given us in his written word than for you to want to hear the audible voice of God. Peter had it. And he said, this is better. Do you read your Bible like that? You who preach and teach the word, you preach it and teach it like that? This is better than mountaintop experiences. This is better than seeing something with my own eyes. This is more fully confirmed. God has given us everything we need to know him, to love him, to trust in the Lord Jesus and obey him. We have the prophetic word. So what? How can we ask, so what? If this is better than the audible voice of God, it's as good as it gets. Next, notice that he answers the so what to, okay, you believe the scriptures are authoritative, so what? Well, he answers that by saying, the scriptures are to be paid attention to as to a lamp shining in a dark place. Look at the second part of verse 19. The scriptures are to be paid attention to as to a lamp shining in a dark place. He says, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Now the translators 
disagree over exactly what morning star rises in your hearts. What does that mean? And some say, well, there's actually a parenthesis that he puts around there. And so what he's really saying is, we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed in your hearts. And then the other part is in parentheses. I don't know. It's not clear to us. Does he mean that in our hearts? Does he mean it in parentheses that we have the prophetic word confirmed in our hearts? I don't think so. He's talking about the day dawns and the morning star rises. That's the day dawns, Jesus ushering in his kingdom. The day dawning is the kingdom. The morning star is the Lord Jesus Christ coming again to judge the living and the dead and usher in his rule and reign. And so grab that and then see what he's saying. How long should we pay attention to the written word of God? Until Jesus comes back. Why do we not pay attention to the word when he comes back? Because then we will see face to face. But until then, you would do well to pay attention to this prophetic word as to a lamp shining in a dark place. The Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, There can be no doubt whatsoever that all the troubles in the church today, and most of the troubles in the world, are due to the departure from the authority of the Bible. I think he said that in the 50s. Oh, it's true today. Most of the problems in local churches today and in the church at large, it's just simply due to the fact that there are many who profess Christ but have totally abandoned the authority of the Scriptures. They may check the boxes, as I may and you may, that I believe the Scripture is authoritative, but it's not the final rule or the final say on what I should believe and what I do. That's not what my life looks like. That's not what our church functions like. That's not what our home functions like. All the problems in the church and many of the world, Lloyd-Jones says, can be traced right there. They're due to the departure from the authority of the Bible. And so I'd say to you in application, what does this mean for you personally sitting right there? You must pay attention to the word. Not just your family or your church, you. You individually must pay attention to the word. The written word of God must be the lamp that illumines the path in front of you that you're walking. Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Do you look to the scriptures concerning how you should live? Isn't that a simple question? Most professed Christians would go, oh, of course. Then you just have to ask, well, why are you doing what you're doing? God's word must be the lighthouse that keeps you from smashing against the rocks of sin. Psalm 119.11, I've stored up your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. Is the scripture a lighthouse for you? You're always looking to the scripture so you don't make a shipwreck of your faith in your life dashing against the rocks of sin. How does the psalmist do it? How does David do it? I've hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The scripture also must be the torch you carry every day. When you find yourself in the dark forest of affliction. When you find yourself suffering, it will not be good enough to know where the light is. You find yourself in that dark forest of suffering, you better have a torch in your hand already. Are you carrying with you in your life by bowing to the authority of God's word, by memorizing the scripture, feasting on it? As it were, are you carrying a torch so that wherever you are, you got light? 
You don't dive deep into the Word of God. You don't memorize it. You don't study it. You don't feast on it. You're going to get into that dark forest of affliction, and you're going to want to abandon the Lord Jesus. You're going to stumble around and not have any light. You need the torch of 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18, especially when you suffer. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient or temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Do you walk around with that torch? This light momentary affliction not to be compared with the weight of glory that will be revealed to us. You can suffer well for Jesus' glory if you're carrying that torch. You must pay attention to the Word of God personally. So audit your own heart and mind right now. Why do you believe what you believe? Why do you do what you do? Why do you structure the time God has given you like you do? Why do you use the money God has given you and made you a steward of like you do? Why do you say what you say? Why do you go where you go? If your answer to any of those questions is not, because the authoritative word of God says this, then you are stumbling in the dark. You would do well to pay attention to this word as a lamp shining in a dark place. Your church must also pay attention to the word. Not just you personally, but your church, your local body that you're a part of. Whether you're a pastor, a deacon, a teacher, a member, or you just attend. The scriptures must be the lights of the church. Without paying careful attention to the prophetic word, local churches become more like country clubs. They become more like social activist groups or concerts or motivational conventions, or recovery programs, or political super PACs. Without paying careful attention to the Word of God, churches become more like groups in the world than they are like the body of Christ, the pillar and buttress of the truth. Whatever position you're at in any church, does your church pay attention to what God says in his word. I'm not asking if you have expository preaching. I'm not asking if, well, we go through books of the Bible. Great, that, I think that's great. What about your ecclesiology? Who leads? Who follows? Who preaches? Who does not preach? Who serves? What do your deacons do? What do they not do? What's the mission of the local church? What should be preached when a pastor or elder gets up in the pulpit? What songs do you sing? And why do you sing them? All of these questions, we can go to the authoritative word of God to answer. And my fear is that many churches, while trying to preach and teach the word, don't really pay attention to some of the explicit things in the word concerning how churches are to act, be governed, and function. Do you exercise church discipline? Or is church discipline not even on your radar? Being so clearly laid out in the scriptures. Is corporate worship a priority. How are we to worship God when we gather together? And how are we not? What are the things we say? 
Yes, because God's word says that. And the other things we say, well, God didn't say we can't do that. God has revealed everything you and I need to know for how to worship him. Pastors, you're gathering for worship. Every single thing that you do, can you point to the people that you are shepherding and say, we do this because God says this? Or are you floating in this, well, God didn't say we can't do it. I would submit to you to think about that deeper. The Lord Jesus has much to say in his word concerning how he wants his church to function. We have to remember Jesus said, I will build my church. It's his church. He will build it. And as he's building it, he wants it organized and structured in specific ways. Does your church pay attention to the word as to a lamp shining in a dark place? Or is it really just like the world? But we talk about Jesus and we quote Bible verses. Third, your home. Not only you, not only your church, your home must pay attention to the word. Who leads? Who leads your household? Or if you're not married yet, who will lead your household when you get married? Who submits? Who is responsible financially to provide for the household? Who is responsible spiritually to provide for the household? Do you do family worship? Do you study the word together? Parents, do you require obedience from your children? Do you instructively bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, showing them what they should do? Do you correctively discipline them? How do you do it? Is corporate worship important to you? What do you spend family time doing? Do you serve together? Your home must pay attention to the word. The Bible must be the candles of the home. Without paying careful attention to the word, your home will be just as worldly as those outside Christ. And all who live there will not flourish. In conclusion, beloved, in the written word, the prophetic word, the scriptures, what we call the Bible... God has given us something more fully confirmed than mountaintop experiences. In the scriptures, God has given us something we must pay attention to until Jesus returns to usher in his kingdom. The majestic glory has given us his very words carried from heaven. The Lord has given us a lamp shining in a dark place. Therefore, the scriptures are the ultimate authority concerning everything you should believe and everything you should do. And what you'll find as you dig into the authoritative word is not simply authoritative words. You'll find what the authoritative word reveals. And that is the authoritative person, the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything in the scriptures is screaming, is pointing us to, is making us long for the Lord Jesus the incarnate word of God. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, he says. He is the one to whom we owe allegiance, and he is the one I have sinned against. The one with all authority in, it, in heaven and on earth is the one you've offended through your sin and rebellion. What does he owe you for that? What is the capital A authority of the universe owe you? What's your paycheck that's coming? For your sin, it's death and hell.
And yet one of the most important questions you can ask when considering Jesus' authority is, what does he do with that authority? What does the infinitely authoritative one do with his authority? John 10. I'm the good shepherd, and I lay down my life for the sheep. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. Now notice the words, authority. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Do you see the good news of the gospel? The authoritative one that owes you nothing but death and hell and his wrath used his authority in order to lay down his life so that you could be ransomed, so that you could be forgiven. This is the authoritative one the scripture reveals. The one who appeared to Moses as a flame of fire plunged himself into the fires of God's judgment for us. The one who came to Israel covered in thick darkness and shaking the mountain endured darkness over the whole land as he was crucified, signifying God's wrath being poured out on him. The one who appeared to Joshua as a warrior with sword drawn allowed himself to be run through with the sword of God's justice for our sin so that we wouldn't be. The one whom God the Father said, This is my beloved son, with whom I'm well pleased, bowed his head and agreed to have his father crush him for our iniquities. This is what the Lord Jesus does with his authority. This is the good news of the gospel. The infinitely authoritative one lays it down for rebels so that you, if you believe on the Lord Jesus, If you trust in him and what he's done with that authority, your sin is taken away. He clothes you with his righteousness. He adopts you into his family. Is that not good news? Look to the scriptures and know that you have divine authority here. And know that ultimately it's revealing the authoritative one, the Lord Jesus Christ. And all who believe in him will never be put to shame. Pray with me. Father God, we thank you for your word. Help us to pay attention to it as to a lamp shining in a dark place. Sanctify us who are in Christ. Make us more like Jesus. And we ask you to cause those who are not yet in Christ to be born again so that they may see your glory shining in the face of Jesus. Help us to worship you, submit to you, and ascribe all glory and honor to you. And it's in the Lord Jesus' name we pray. Amen.